revival being very tired and worn. We have had very much fellowship along the road, wonderful meetings, with greeting the Christians from place to place, from up the, down the East Coast and also up the West Coast into Canada. And with fine cooperation among all the different denominational churches of the Assemblies of God in the United Pentecostal Church of God, Foursquare, and many of the other organizations which cooperated, having great meetings. A great success as far as it could be called success today, and perhaps maybe many would call it great, but myself, I'm an, a, a, a revivalist, and it, the revival, nationally speaking, is just about ended. And we are, I like to see revival where hearts are on fire, not adding members, but revival. Our Lord did many miracles of healing the people, and of course, several got saved. And now I'm home resting for a little while and going uh, back into the service in a few weeks to Lord willing. And now this is to the many peoples and friends of mine around the world. I wish to state tonight here in the tabernacle, uh, if you, any of you were present and could see they're real warm in the tabernacle night, people are packed in and all around, standing doors and outside of their cars and things, and it's very hot. And it'll be difficult for the people and for myself also. But I have come to this place that I want to explain what stage of time we are living in according to the ministry that the Lord gave me. And I wanted to record it from the tabernacle. It came on my heart last spring, but I waited till I got back here so I could get a, a recording of it to send it to you peoples of the world. It's been about 32 years ago that when the Lord Jesus, within 150 yards of where I'm present standing now here in Jeffersonville at 8th and Penn Street, the morning when I laid the cornerstone on this tabernacle, just being then merely a swamp, and I lived just across the way to my left here, it was before I was married. I was living with my father and mother that the Lord Jesus broke me up the morning that the cornerstone was to be laid about early, about six o'clock. I've been lying in bed for some time with my heart full of joy, thinking of this great time that the Lord God was going to give me a tabernacle to preach in. I was merely a young boy then. And that day, I, the girl that I was going with, which was soon to be my wife for the following year, was to be with us the day we was to lay the cornerstone. And I remember that morning when I'd waken up and laying in the room in the upstairs right here on 7th Street, something said, rise up to your feet. And I got up. And I saw as it was a great place. And it was like a, a, a place where they would, a river run in the valley. And I got down there to the river and I understood it was a place where John the Baptist had been baptizing the people and they had turned it into a hog lot. And I was very critical of it, just saying that that should not be done. And while I was there, there was a, a voice spoke to me and took me up, and I noticed the tabernacle in just about the state it's in right now. But there were so many people till they were just packed all in, in the tabernacle in this condition, about the state it's at now. And... Uh, I, heard, I was happy standing behind the pulpit saying, God, how good you are to give me a tabernacle. And at that time, the angel of the Lord spoke to me and said, but this is not your tabernacle. And I said, then, Lord, where is my tabernacle? And he taken me up in the spirit again and set me down in a grove. And way down the grove 
was just rows of trees setting just level, about 20 feet tall or 30, and they looked like fruit trees, and they were in great big green buckets. And then I noticed to my right hand and to my left hand, there was an empty bucket on either side. And I said, what about these? And he said, you're to plant them. So I pulled a limb from the tree to my right and placed it in a bu bucket on the right side and a limb from the left hand and placed it in a bucket on the left side. Quickly they growed all the way into the skies. And he said, hold out your hands and gather the fruit thereof. And in one hand fell a great yellow apple, mellow and ripe. And in the other hand fell a great yellow plum, mellow and ripe. And it said, Eat the fruit thereof, because it's pleasant. And I ate from one and from the other. Very delicious. You know the vision? It's wrote in one of the books, I think, Life Story or Prophet Visits Africa. And just then I held up my hands and was shouting the glory of God. And all of a sudden that pillar of fire came down over the top of those trees. And the roar and the lightnings flashed, and the winds blew real hard, and the leaves began to blowing from the trees, and I looked way down. It's in the shape of this tabernacle, the way it sets now, and at the end where the pulpit would be, there were three trees, and those three trees taking shape of three crosses. And I noticed that both plums and apples were gathered in a clusters around the middle cross. And I ran real fast, screaming to the top of my voice, and fell down upon this cross or by the cross, and threw my arms around it. And the winds began to shake, and the uh, fruit from the cross, and it fell all over me. And I was so happy, just rejoicing. And it said, "Eat the fruit thereof, because it's pleasant." And then this circling of fire called out, said, "The harvest is ripe, and the labors are few." And he said, now when you come to yourself again, or come out of this, read 2 Timothy 4. 2 Timothy 4. And then I came to myself, and I stood there rubbing my face and my hands. And just then, in the corner of the room, sun shining high, then I must have been under the vision for some hour or more, and it said... 2 Timothy 4. And I reached quickly for my Bible and read 2 Timothy 4. Now, I wish to read that now. And as strange as it seems, as I read this 2 Timothy 4, the place that I stopped, and many times that I've preached on that here in this tabernacle, it seems strange that I'd always stop on that. Now, in 2 Timothy 4, the first five verses, which five is a number of grace, I read this. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instance, in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall, heap, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. But... Watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, and do the work of an evangelist, and make full proof of thy ministry. Amen. Did you ever notice? And I never noticed it till this last May. I never read any more of that scripture until there. That's all I ever read of it. Because that seemed like it, it, it was it suffices. Because it was telling me to preach the word and to endure afflictions and to be long-suffering 
For the time was coming when they would not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust should heap teachers, having itching ears, and would be turned from truth unto fables. But now he never said, I was an evangelist. He said, do the work of an evangelist, Paul telling Timothy. See? Did you notice how it says? He didn't say, now you have been called to be an evangelist. It said, do the work of an evangelist. See? Now, we notice there then. Now, if I would say with all my heart, and the best of my knowledge, that has been fulfilled to the letter. Amen. Just exactly. Now, that's 30 years ago. And so far as I know, that every vision that he's ever given me has been fulfilled, except the one that I'm to, a change in my ministry to where I'm to pray for people in a little place, like a little room under a tent or a big auditorium or something, it looked to me like a tent. You remember that two or three years ago? Yeah. Most all of it was brought to pass. I was to go down in Mexico and how it would rain that night and what it would take place down there. And he told me my ministry of the first pool. Remember about catching a little bitty fish or missing it? Second one was a small fish. But then he told me on the third pool, don't fail. See? Right. And don't tell people. I'm always trying to explain what I'm trying to do. He let me know not to tell people what you're doing. Just do what he tells me to do and let it alone, see? But I'm that type of person. I have no secrets, so I just tell everything I know. So that's, uh, that's just the breed, I guess. But uh, that does, I'll try, I love people, and I want people to be saved so bad till I try to tell them everything I know uh, unless it's something he's told me not to tell, of course, so that they won't miss it. See, I want them to see it so close that there'll be no error in it. Now, that comes to pass just exactly. Now, remember, the charge was, if we'll study that for a moment, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. See? Judge, charge you before God in Christ that you, that you preach the Word. And so help me to this night, as far as I have any knowledge of, I've never preached nothing but the Word, see? And stayed right with it. It's been a lot of trouble. Now I've went through lots of persecutions, and lots of trials, had to separate from many precious friends because of that very statement. Preach the Word. And I, I have, you remember in the vision or the little translation, as I would call it, recently, where I was taken and saw those people and looked back to myself and all those millions there. And I said, I want to see Jesus. And he said, He's higher. Well, see, when people die, they, they don't immediately go up with God. Now, you, I'm sure you'll understand that. Maybe I'll explain it the best that I can. Are you in a hurry? No, no. Let's take our time Amen. And, and, and try to make it just as clear as I can. Now, when we come along, we remember that we live here in three dimensions. And I don't know whether I can name them or not. One of them is light, and the other is matter. Tommy, you remember what the third is, huh? Adam? Time. time. Right. Now, light, matter, and time. And our five senses contact them dimensions. Our sight contacts light. Our feeling contacts matters and so forth. Now, but we have contact through science, the fourth dimension as it was. Because coming right through this building now comes pictures, voices of radio, pictures on television, that our senses does not contact that. But yet they have a, a tube or a crystal that picks up those ether waves and manifests them. So you see, right in this building now is live actions of people in the air. 
live voices. They're here. We know it. They're absolutely the truth. And the only thing you do, they catch it on. I don't understand the mechanics of, of those things that science has invented. But we know that it proves to us there is a fourth dimension. Now, the fifth dimension is where the sinner, the unbeliever, dies and goes to. The fifth dimension is the kind of the, well, the horrible dimension. Now, this man, you know, when a Christian dies, he goes into the sixth dimension. And God is in the seventh dimension. Now, then you see the Christian, when he dies, he goes under the altar of God, right into the presence of God. Under the altar, and he's at rest. To break it down, <clears throat> when a man has a nightmare, he's not altogether asleep. Neither is he awake. He's between sleep and awake, and that's what makes him have a horrible shaking and screaming. Because he's not asleep, he's not awake. And to take that shows where a man goes when he dies unconverted. He's lived his time up. He's dead on earth. And he cannot go in the presence of God because he's not fit to go there without the blood. And he's caught. He cannot come back to earth because his time's finished here on earth. And he's caught between and he's in a nightmare. See? He can't go in the presence of God to rest. He can't back come to earth because his time's up. He's in a nightmare. And there he stays until the day of the judgment. Amen. A horrible thing to be in. See? And now, in this vision... I believe I was caught to that sixth dimension, looking back down here, and could see back. See, the sight isn't exactly with the eyes, that's earthly, but it, sight is a greater thing than the sight that they have there. Their contact is far beyond any contact that our natural senses would contact. Here some time ago I was explaining I was looking at a, a television picture where they let a man down, I think, two mile or a mile deep in the ocean, and they had ray lights that went out. They're showing marine life. And there come fish by, that horrible-looking creatures, that it's midnight ink black down there, and they had phosphorus on their nose, and they had no eyes. Now, they have to be fed so it looked like to find their food... They were guided with another sense, not sight because they didn't have eyes, couldn't use them down there. But they were guided with another sense that they could contact their food. And I thought, if I could have control of that little fish with my sight, how much greater could I supply his food and lead him places, how much greater my sight is than his radar he contacts. See? And I thought, if I could just lead him, then it come to me, if I could only surrender myself to God, Amen. how much greater is the sight and senses of God Amen. who could guide us much more than the things that we see because the faith that He supplies us is the evidence of things not seen Amen. with our eyes. Then, if that little fish could never come up to the top of the water like other fish because He's pressurized, He'd bring him up, he'd explode. No more than we can go up higher and keep from exploding. We are pressurized for the, the place that we live. But now, if that little fish could ever come up here and be me, would he ever want to be that little fish again down in that midnight blackness? He'd never want to be a fish. No more. Because he's something greater than a fish. He's a man. His senses are greater. His understanding is greater. His intelligence is supreme. Yep. Then multiply that by ten million. Then you get what it is when you pass from this into the presence of God. God where the human being is so much farther than what we are here. You never want to be a human being like this no more. Down in this pest house of sickness and corruption. And it's been that in my heart. And I've tried these 30 years to preach the gospel around the world to tell people that there is a heaven uh, to, to gain and there is a hell to shun Amen. and there is a God that loves you and a, a redeeming power that's laying ready to pick you up Amen. at any time that you're ready to Amen. receive it. Amen. Like a man drowning, a rope hanging there. He thinks, well, the rope, I can pull myself out, but I'm not worthy to get the rope. 
The rope was put there for that very purpose. For you to pull yourself out Amen. with. That's the reason Jesus Christ died for the very purpose of saving sinners. And he dangled the rope of eternal life, which this very night will pass over every sinner's head in here and a welcome sign hanging on it. Come up out of it. If you, if you wish to do it, the preparation is made. Now, when I seen that place and that condition that those people were in, and how beyond anything that this world could ever think of. It was glorious. There could not be sin there. No death or nothing could enter that spot. And there was no difference between man and women. Only the, the sex glands was gone from them and they could never be no more adultery, no more nothing. But she was still a woman in the way of figure and man was still figure and they'll forever be that way because when God... Now, this might be good some of you high school kids that's getting this stuff taught into you here about evolution. Now, I believe in evolution, but not in the way that man evoluted from, um, from some lower species. Their own theory backfires upon them when they try to hybrid anything. It won't breed itself back. So, you see, it, it's backfired on them. Now, I believe that when God began to bathe the earth, maybe the first thing he did come forth with was a jellyfish. And from that to a frog and on up. But you see, it continually come closer and closer to the image of man. And man was a reflection of God. Amen. And that's the reason that grass become evoluted. Maybe a grass and then from grass come flowers, from flowers come shrubs, from shrubs comes tree. Why? It's a picture of the tree of life. Standing on the other side, and everything on this side that's natural is a shadow of the supernatural or the eternal on the other side. Therefore, as long as there's a born-again Christian on the earth, and we got a body here like this, it's a very reflection of one that's waiting on the other side where there is no death and sorrow. And that's what makes our hearts hunger for such as that. See, there's something in us that calls out. Amen. We just... There's something that tells us it's there. Amen. I believe through these years, I apologize before God and the people of being stupid and being making many mistakes. But through these many years, I have been privileged to see many millions of people come into the kingdom of God and have been uh, thankful to the Lord to let me lead them there. And I believe they'll be there on that day. Now, the vision was fulfilled. And how I ever come to ever stop not knowing on that fifth verse. That's all I ever read. But there's some more to that chapter. Several more verses. Now, you might in your hotel room or home tonight, as soon as we dismiss, read the rest of that. Because I've got several scriptures wrote out here that I want to refer to and notes that I want to refer to. <clears throat> And I want you to read it when you go home. I'll quote it. It'll be on the tape. You want to mark some of it down? Well, it'll be all right. Now, do you believe that men and women, which I know you do, are led by the Spirit of God to do things? Amen. And Jesus was our pattern. If you would notice it, I want to turn you turn with me to St. Luke, the fourth chapter, just a minute. And I want to show you something striking, and just so we won't get to too much of these re references, but that you'll be able to uh, uh, read with me here for, on this one for just a few moments. St. Luke, the fourth chapter, and the fourteenth verse we begin. Now watch real close here if you want to see something happen that this parallel. I notice. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit unto Galilee. He returned in the power of the Spirit unto Galilee. And there went out a fame of him throughout all the regions around about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up far to read. And there was delivered unto him 
the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written, was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, and he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to preach deliverance to the captives and to recover sight to the blind and to set at liberty them that are bruised and to preach the acceptable year of our Lord. And he closed the book. Now, if you want to, if you want a reference to that, I've got it here. Just a moment, if I maybe pick it up out of the margin reading here. If you notice, that's also... You'll find it over in Mark and different places, but in Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. Now, isn't it strange that he stopped right there and the Mary next verse, that was what was applied to his first coming, and the second next verse is applying to his second coming at judgment. He stopped and closed the book. If any of you are reading a Schofield Bible, you'll find a footnote on it there. See? Watch your footnote. Of Mark 2, a footnote, see, and uh, you'll notice there a comparison with the, the message quoted in Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, affords the instance of the, uh, where the scripture here, preaching, Jesus was to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, and the next verse comes out with his coming and judgment, see, and you see, I stop right at that, and how I never noticed that. And how it always stopped at this fifth verse. For the time will come when they do not endure sound doctrine, but for heap themselves with teachers having itching ears, and will be turned from the truth to fables. But do the work of an evangelist. Amen. Take full proof of your ministry. See? And by God's help and grace, I've tried to do that. And I want my friends both here and out into the lands where the tapes will go. The reason that I have took the stand that I have for the Word is this very reason. Amen. Preach the Word. Amen. That's the reason I would not retaliate with any of the creeds, any of the denominations, because I have been commissioned of God to stay with the Word. Amen. Now, if anybody else wants to do anything else, that's up to them. And if you notice in the vision that I had of the, my ministry, it was, I've never crossed those trees. I have never proselyted. I have never said, all you Trinitarians be oneness, or all you oneness be Trinitarians. I have planted in their own vessels. Just exactly. I went to the Trinitarian. I went to the oneness. I went to everybody and stayed between and never joined any of them but stayed between being a brother just exactly what that vision said do. Amen. And have eat the fruit from both sides. Amen. Salvation Amen. on both sides. And now did you notice there's many Trinitarian people sitting here. There's many oneness. And there's many different... But how little you would be to fuss about it. Because if that part of the vision was true, the other part's true too. Both fruits was found in the cross. Both of them was in the cross. All clustered together and both plums and pear or peach, plums and apples rained down on me. There, both of them. All found in the cross because they all believe in God and are filled with the Holy Ghost and have the Christian works and signs following. Now, the denomination won't have nothing to do with it. It'll be the born again that'll have anything to do with it. It'll be your experience with God that'll have to do with it. Now, we see so much of that. I've got several scriptures here that I'd like to refer to. Maybe it will a little later on. But now, I want to take you from the fifth verse on down to the eighteenth verse. And now, to save time, I, I won't read it. But now, Paul... Starting off over here in Timothy again. If you notice how he began to speak, it's pathetic. Now, if you notice at the fifth verse, For I am now ready to be offered and my time of departure is at hand. Fixing to leave the scene. 
starts off. Hey? I have... Oh, watch. My, I'm ready in my departure's hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me at that day. And not only me only, but all them also that love his appearing. And then he goes ahead to tell, do all, do these things. What for him to bring the coat? Now we start right off. And he says, Demas has forsaken me. There must come a time in his ministry when he was a young evangelist, a young prophet. Everybody was for him. But now you notice on down the years that all man has forsaken him. What for? The Word. When Jesus, a young prophet of Galilee, he got a time that he was forsaken. All man who stay with God's Word gets to that place where they are forsaken by the world and the religious world. Jesus fed 5,000 one day and they picked up baskets full of, of fragrance off of five loaves and two fishes. And the very next day, I believe it was, He began to come down with the Word and all of them began to depart from Him. Amen. And He looked around to the disciples and said, Will you go also? Even 70 of His own ordained ministers left Him. Yes. Amen. And He said, Will you go also? And then Peter spoke those notable words by saying, Lord, where would we go? Thou only has eternal life. Amen. Notice, but the time come when the forsaking time come, and it's it's got to come. Yes, it must come. And now I've got several prophets and things in here to refer to to prove to you that that time come, and it's arrived for me. No need of trying to rub away from it. It's here. And you just must take it. They didn't rub away from it. They stood and tuck it. Not being ashamed of the gospel. You notice, Paul, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. Oh, my. Oh, now you said I fought with beasts and I, I was delivered out of the lion's mouth. And the things that he went, God was good to him. But the time had come when he was going to depart. Now, let's just wonder, why would a man, a minister, associate like Demas was to Paul ever leave Paul? You know, Brother Baxter, many of you remember him. He used to read it's about Demas. He said, you know what I'm going to do, Brother Bram, when I get to heaven, the first thing I'm going to do? And I said, what? He said, I'm going to walk right up and find out where Demas is and go to sock him this as hard as I can. And said, he's going to turn around and say, Pastor, what would you do that for? He said, why would you leave poor little Paul when everybody forsaken him? <laughs> I don't prescribe to that. I don't believe they have some fights up there. But I just thought about Brother Baxter saying that because he felt so sorry for Paul. Well, what had Paul done? He had preached just as loyal as he could and the Holy Spirit was on him. And when he wrote down there about those lady ministers and things, I imagine there's a blow-up. He said, let the women keep silent. The church does not permit them speaking to him in jail right then. Could you imagine what some of them bishops said? Huh, that guy up there in jail, what business he got right down here with that? See? And he's got Timothy Winebibber with him. <laughs> so here he is up there now that he's feeding Timothy on wine. And here he is leaning in jail and writing down tell us what the Holy Ghost ought to tell us to do. <laughs> but he said, If what come the Word of God out of you and came it from you only? If any man thinks himself to be spiritual or a prophet, let him acknowledge that what I write is the commandments Amen. of the Lord. Amen. Amen. See, the time comes, friends. And I want the people in the land of the tapes goes to to remember that the separating time has to come. It must do it. I don't know how far I am from the end time, the end of the road. I don't know. That's up to God. I don't know what tomorrow is and who. I don't know what it holds, but I know who's holding it. So that's where my faith is built. 
on that. Now, I imagine Demas didn't forsake him and tore off the nightclubs. I don't imagine Demas did that. Because Demas was a spirit-filled man. He was a great helper. If you ever took the history of Demas, he was a notable preacher, a fine, cultured man, highly polished, educated. He was a smart man. But why would he forsake Paul? That's the thing. What made him do it? Forsake Paul. I don't believe he wanted to go to a nightclub or anything, but I believe it was God separating Paul. Now, I imagine Demas, let's take some of Demas' thoughts. As I was sitting down on the hillside wandering the other day, about daylight, and I was thinking, why would Demas want to leave that fellow? Why would he leave that poor little preacher that led him to the Lord? Amen. The man who spearheaded the revival amongst the Gentiles. A prophet indeed. No one could say but what he was a prophet. Amen. He is more than a prophet, he is an apostle. Yeah. And a great and mighty apostle to the Gentiles. And Demas would associate it with Paul had fellowship and seeing the Spirit of God move upon that man. Amen. And why would he turn his back on such a person as that had been vindicated that he was a servant of Christ? Amen. Yeah. Do you notice Paul here? Loving this present world. Yeah. Amen. Now, I don't think Demas backslid. I don't think he did that. But I think he, he got the wrong opinion of Paul. Now, wow. Demas come out of a rich family. And he was wealthy. And money sometimes means religion to people. Uh, like they say in California, if you haven't got three Cadillacs, you're not spiritual. So it means if you're not successful, if you don't have the finest church there is in the city, the people won't go. It's almost that way here, Pooja. You, you've got to have the finest church in the country. Or they say, you, well, you mean you joined up a little bunch like that? Did you know our Lord didn't have a place to lay his head? Amen. Did you know he only owned one coat? Amen. And he, had, he was just kind of a person who was pushed about. And he didn't have no place to lay his head. But they could have thought the same thing it did about him. And now, I believe Demas saw a failing seemingly in Paul's ministry. I think that he thought the old fellow was washed up before God. Now, he thought that a people that would pluck their eyes out to give to Paul. Yeah. Now, the, Paul said that. He said, you would at least pluck your eyes out to give them to me. Because Paul, we think, had bad eyes. Because he said, I wrote with such big letters. He said, big letter, but I got the, the lexicon and it says, with big letters. It's in Roman prison there. Is something wrong? He said his eyes have been by him since the heavenly vision. So he, uh, the people would have plucked out their eyes seeing Paul suffer, his eyes bothering him, and he suffered and he asked the Lord to heal him three times. And he said, except I would get exalted above the abundance of the revelation there was sent to me a messenger of the devil that he might buffet me. Now it would get pretty good, then hit him again. Then get good and hit him again. You see, Paul had a ministry greater than all the rest of the apostles put together. Some of them could have said, well, I walk with Jesus. One man on the street walked with him when he was here. But Paul saw him in the pillar of fire after he was dead, buried, ascended into heaven and returned back and called Paul. On the road down to Damascus. And he had a greater ministry than Matthew, Lot, Mark, Luke, or any of them others. He was far beyond them. And he said, except I get exalted now, and say, now you fellows don't know nothing about it. I've seen the Lord after his resurrection. Well, they say, we walk with him, and so did all that people down around Galilee and Nazareth and through the country there. They all walk with him. But you see, Paul had talked with him and saw him in the form that he was before he was made in flesh. Amen. And he commissioned Paul in that state. Amen. While he was in that light, he commissioned Paul. And, and Paul had saw him and he said, except I'd get exalted, I'd feel a little higher than some of you, brother. There was given to me a messenger of the devil that keeps him beat down. And he said, I sought the Lord three times to take it away from me. And he said, Saul, or Paul, my grace is sufficient. Yeah. 
Then Paul said, I'll glory in my infirmities, because when I am weak, then I am strong. See? I will glory in it. Now, did you notice? Now, a man that had a ministry greater than any of the rest of them that had been on the field, Paul, the greatest ministry of all of them, that had seen Jesus in a pillar of fire and commissioned him to do what he done and was vindicated by the same God and the same power Amen. with signs and wonders beyond any question and was so poor he only had one coat. Amen. Preaching to a bunch of people that would have plucked their eyes out in some of the millionaires. And yet Paul had one coat. He said, bring that coat. Getting cold up here. He's in the mountain country. He only had one coat. And Demas to a man that was of high standing, high caliber, cultured, educated, and a rich man that had many changes of clothes, that guy was something wrong with him. That had so many friends that would pluck their eyes out to give it to him, and yet he's so poor he had one coat. Something was wrong with Paul. Oh, you know that spirit don't leave the world. Amen. They still have it that way. Amen. Money ain't God. Amen. There's only one God. Amen. But people think because you have a big ministry, you ought to own all this and all this and all these great big things and big schools and big so and so. God doesn't deal in them things. Amen. Or at least that's been my opinion. God deals with an individual. Amen. He never did ordain us to go do such things. But Paul, with one coat, and he tells Timothy here to bring it to him because it's getting cold up there. Amen. A man that had a ministry that preached to the tens of thousands that Paul did, and a ministry that could do all kinds of miracles and seen Jesus in a pillar of fire commission him, and yet on one coat. Demas said a fellow like that, he'd turn away from him. Now, when he was up here preaching towards Taurus, we find out that there's a man up there was a coppersmith. And he was a rascal. And he hated Christianity. And he'd done everything to Paul that he could do to him. Had him thrown in jail and everything. Even Paul warns Timothy the same thing. Yeah. What's that guy? And here's Demas... God let the people hear it. Amen. Here stood Demas standing by a man Amen. that struck a man blind for disputing with him. Yeah. Now you Church of Christ preachers, put on your coats now. I had one tell me one time, said, smite me blind, smite me blind. You got the Holy Ghost, smite me blind. I said, you're already blind. Amen. 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 Now, why didn't Paul smite the coppersmith blind? That same kind of a spirit that's on people that think that is the same thing was on Demas. Amen. A man that could smite a man blind for disputing with him and then turn him at a coppersmith for his ministry in the city. No doubt Demas said he, he's washed up. He's lost all of his gifts. He's, he's lost his gifts of smiting blind. <laughs> Don't you see how that spirit still lives? Yes. Amen. Amen. See, you're washed up, brother. It, it just goes over to people's head. They just don't get it. That's all it is. They just can't see it. They don't understand. Now, Demas didn't smite that man blind because he wanted to. Didn't Jesus say, I do nothing until the Father shows me first? Haven't I told you years ago if my own mother was laying dying and would say, Bill, what's my outcome? I couldn't say nothing until God said so first. And that's just what happened. Man, can't, man is a failure to begin with. He's only an agent to which God works through, and God works His own will. But when you see these super-duper people that's always having this and that and the other, you better stay away from it. Jesus Himself didn't do that. He said, I only work as the Father works. Amen. He shows Amen. me what to do, and then I go do it. I can't do other, anything otherwise than that. Amen. And your Demas saw Paul, a man that had a ministry like that, and yet was so 
poor that he only owned one coat and wanted Timothy to bring it to him. One coat. But Paul set the example like Christ was. He had one coat. And why does riches and lots of money and things mean so much to people today? Notice. Now, and he had power that anybody that was contrary to what he preached, he turned around and said, you'll be blind for a season. Uh, And the man was blind. And there was a coppersmith done ten times to him what that man done, and yet got away with it. Demas must have thought, well... See, the old fellow's washed up now. He's, he's lost his ministry. No, no. He hasn't lost his ministry. Not at all. God don't do things like that. God's not an Indian giver. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. <clears throat> Notice now. Paul was something on the order like Elijah. Elijah the prophet went up on the mountain by the commission of God and called far, far to fall out of heaven. Amen. And it fell. Amen. And he called for water. And it come. And then he commanded by the message of God and kill 400 priests. Amen. Chopped their heads off, let them roll down the hill. Yeah. Amen. And then run at the threat of the, a woman. Yeah. One little hypocrite woman, or she's the infidel, Jezebel. That one little woman which was a keynote to every bit of it. She's the one cause it looked like it had got her first. But God has ways of doing things and His servants only can work according if He works according to the will of God. Don't you see, friends, you've got to move according to God's way of moving. How many times have I sat in counsel of brethren and how I would like to walk over and shake their hand and say, Brethren, it doesn't make any difference. Let's just be brethren along. How can I do that and keep my commission? Preach the word. That's right. Amen. That's right. Amen. I don't want to do that. Praise the Lord. I've stood amongst ministers and say, Brother Branham, uh, my aunt's over here. I know you're a prophet sent from God. Go over and restore her sight. I wish I could. I'd do it. I can't do it till he tells me to do it. See? No one could do it. Elijah couldn't do it. No one else could do it. Now, we find out that Paul, Demas, preaching with Paul, had seen Paul see a crippled man laying there and said, I perceive you have faith to be healed. Stand up on your feet. Jesus Christ makes you well. Amen. Had seen him heal the sick. And yet, he leaves his friend Theophilus sick. Amen. Paul's lost his ministry. That's what Demas must have thought. Why didn't he, if he had a gift of healing, why didn't he go up there and heal that buddy that stood by him so faithful? He said, I've left him up there sick. Now I ain't got no coat, and I want you to bring me that coat along. And be careful that copper smith, he just ruined that meeting in the city. I had to leave the town. He put me in jail. I imagine Demas said, what kind of a preacher has this turned out to be? And brother, they got a lot of them demon spirits in the world today. Yeah. They don't know what it's all about. That's right. Okay? No need trying to explain it to them because they won't get it anyhow. Amen. Okay? Amen. A servant of Christ follows the footprints. Amen. One of our deacons here, I don't know where he's here tonight or not, is Tony Zabel. He's usually around here. And he came to me and he said here not long ago before he got come over here he said he said I, I had a dream a funny dream he said I, I dreamed I was trying to find my way upward towards heaven he said I seen a man coming uh, with a black robe on and was uh, 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 reading a book and said I, I got to this man and I asked him which way to heaven and he said ask the man ahead of me and that was a, a pastor of a church that he went to he went a little farther and he met another man. He had a little black robe and was singing songs going on. And that was another pastor. Both them pastors are personal friends of mine. And he said, a fine man. And he said, uh, uh, which way do I get up top of the mountain here? He said, 
Look here. Said, see, standing way up there on the top, that little bitty guy? I said, yes. So there stood a guy with a pair of overalls along where a little cowboy hat. Someone said, I can tell you that. Talking about me down there, said, that guy looks anything like, but a preacher. <laughs> Might look like a farmer or something. <laughs> but, you know, it, it ain't looks. I said, and it was me standing up there, and he, he climbed up to you, got to me, and said, I got him in the arm and led him on up to got top of the hill. And there was a wilderness to go through. And I said, Tony, I must leave you here. You must walk some of this by yourself. He said, Brother Branham, what can I do from here on? So I said, come here, Tony. Look down there. You see them barefooted tracks with blood in them? I said, that's what I followed all the way. Just stay on that. That's the only thing I know to point, man, to. Not to a creed or sensation of some sort, but to those bloody footprints that lead to the Bible. The blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Now, how that man must have felt. A man with so many millionaire friends in one coat. A man that was had power to smite a man blind and let a man run him out of town. Never done a thing about it. Got up and went out. Let, prayed for the sick and had left his friends sick. And Demas left him. All the rest of them left him. All of them left him. Paul said, all men left him. Every one of them left him. I say this. When a man stands true to the Word, not just in one meeting, but in every meeting, when a man stands true to the Word, the time will come when they'll leave him. Exactly. They did, they did it to our Lord. They'll leave him when he stands for truth. All man has forsaken me. And now what do you think that Demas and some of that man thought when we all know that know the Scripture that Luke was a doctor? And Paul, wherever he went, took this doctor with him. <laughs> and preaching divine healing. And leaving his friends sick. So poor he had one coat. And let a man run him out of town when he could smite a man blind. See, they thought he was washed up. But he wasn't. He was exactly in the bloody footprints. He was following on. I hope you're understanding. He said, All man has forsaken me. Demas loving this present world. Popularity of man. Hello, Dr. Demas. I know you got your P.A. Oh, sure, they love that. Jesus said, how you like to stand in synagogues, be called a rabbi, and so forth, said, you only receive more damnation. Hmm? Amen. Now, we know, when they seen this doctor following him, or with him, and Paul talked to Luke, said, he said, said You're, Luke, is, Luke is the only one that had forsaken him, and Luke is, is good to him, but Luke is uh, prosperous to him. He needs Luke for his ministry. And this doctor following a man around wherever he went and preached divine healing. And a man that preached divine healing could heal a cripple and raise up the dead and everything else and see mighty visions and speak things that would come to pass and left his own co-worker sick. And could have had a million dollars and built buildings worth tens of thousands of dollars and big schools and things like that and didn't even have but one coat put on his back. Demas said, I ain't associating a guy like that. He's just, a, he's a low class of person. I'll go up with the denominational brethren. I'll go up where I'll be somebody. If it was such a thing, I'd like to walk and, uh, right after Baxter gets through. <laughs> See? <laughs> For leaving that poor little guy in that shape, he already been standing by him. Paul was the one who led him to Christ. But you see, it's without knowing the Spirit, knowing what the will of God is, then doing the will of God. See? Now, but there he left him in that condition. Left him all men and forsaken him. How I think of that. How a servant that will stand true to the word. Sooner or later, just remember, the people are going to forsake him. Now we want to strike that just for a few minutes. Now I won't keep you too long now because I want you here in the morning. 
always when God's servant stands true to the word, all forsake him, and it, now just take anywhere you want to, any time in the Bible or in history, that when a man stayed true, no matter how popular he was, when he stayed true to the word, the time come when the religious world forsaken him and cut him off. Now just read it. If you take the Bible from Genesis over to the book of Revelations and pick up in the pre nicene Council and take down to the Nicene Fathers and every man, every saint, every prophet, Every true servant of God that stayed with the word was forsaken by the ecclesiastical thing and cast down. And Paul was one of them. And if it be one today, it'd be the same thing. It's exactly the truth. You have to hit that place. It has to come. They think that a man that would have a ministry like that, he ought to have the world right under his thumb. He should, but it won't come under his thumb. And a man like that wouldn't put a ministry or a world under his thumb. He'd put it under his master's thumb. Because he's not here representing himself. He's representing his master. Amen. You know, a uh, man tried to seek honor one from another, and they honor one another. And dishonor God by doing so. Oh, yeah. See? We try to make big people among us. And when we're no big people and little people, we're all little people. Amen. There's only one big one among us, and that's our Lord. Amen. See? And we make our organization so much bigger than God, the great holy church of this, that, and the other, the great holy bishops and so forth. There's no such things as that. That's honor of man. There's only one holy, and that's God. Amen. And the Holy Ghost, which is God, is among us. It's not us that's holy. It's the Holy Spirit that's in us. Amen. It's not when we see things done, it isn't us doing it. It's the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus said, it's not me that doeth the works. It's my Father. He dwelleth in me, and he's the one that does the works. And it isn't him that it's a doing. All right. But we find them true servants down through the time. Now here's the thing I want to kind of uh, exercise on for a, a few moments. Now, it's usually at such a time as this when man has stayed true to the Word and all men have forsaken him until God steps in in defense of that person and crowns his ministry. Amen. Right. What a consolation. Amen. Our consolation is built in the promise of God's Word. No matter what the world says, what the world does, that's not our hopes. It's not built in what the worlds are doing. I think that song is so pretty. Wish I could sing. I always wanted to sing. See? Uh, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like an eagle. They'll run and not be weary. If they walk, they'll not faint. Teach me, Lord, to wait. Teach me, Lord, to wait down on my knees. I like that. And in your own good time, you'll answer my pleas. Teach me not to rely on what others do, but just wait in prayer for an answer from you. That's it. That's the true servant that waits for his master's turn. Knowing this, that the Scriptures cannot fail regardless of what happens. The Scriptures got to stand true. In such a time as that is when God usually steps in to help him. Let us look at Elijah. When he had been forsaken. Why? Because he had stayed true to the Word. He said, all men has forsaken me. And he was excommunicated from society, from the organization, from the even national organization of the National Church of Israel, the priests and all had thrown him out. And he had not even a coat as much as Paul, but a little piece of sheepskin or leather draped around him and set up on a mountain and was fed by the birds. Why? For the Word of God's sake. Because he was true to thus saith the Lord. 
Now they all went modern. The first lady of the land, Jezebel, had got all the fashions and things out, and the priests had given into it, and so forth, and all of the preachers and so forth that coordinated into it. But not Elijah. He stayed true to that word. And for such a thing, he was forsaken. So he cried out, Lord, I'm the only one that's left. And they even seek my life. But God give him some consolation. Say, so I got 7,000 yet down there. <laughs> See, I don't believe Elijah felt puffed up about that, and he was the only one. But I think he was just so forsaken. Every time he'd go up to a priest to hold a meeting, they'd turn him out. He'd go down here, get out of here, you fanatic. Get out of here, go do this. It showed when Elijah come along, his successor. Well, what did they do? They even. The young fellow was bald-headed, and they sent their little children out to make fun of them old quacks. Said, both of them was considered quack. Said, old bald-head, bald-head, why didn't you go up like Elisha did? Yeah. They didn't believe he went up. Mm-hmm. See? Just they thought he was a bunch of quacks. But they were true to the word with an vindicated ministry. Amen. Elijah stood. All right. Daniel took a true stand. You know where you get that in Daniel 12. Or Daniel 9, please. When you, Daniel took a true stand for the Word. What happened to him? When he was a right-hand man to the king. But he took a true stand for the Word and was excommunicated and Amen. thrown into a lion's den. Yes, a man of God, standing true to the Word. The Hebrew children, stay true to the Word. So Under the glad. king's proclamation. That whosoever shall not bow to that image, when the palstries sound and the trumpets beat, blow out and so forth, every who will not bow to our image will be thrown into the fiery furnace, and they turn their back to the image. They, regardless of how unpopular they become, regardless of how excommunicated they'd be from the society, they stayed true to the Word. I like that. Jacob, another... He had a, been away from home for a long time, and he had a call to go home to see his people. And he was on his road, true to his call, true to his leading. He had things fine over there, but God began to deal with him to go home. And on his road home was thrown between two tight places. His wife and children on this side, and his hated brother Esau coming here with the army to meet him. And he stood at the little book, brook pencil there. And there he stood. And what a condition. Esau, hating him, coming with an army to meet him. And here was his wife, two wives and children all on this side of the brook. And he was caught in a tight place. Yes. Why? Because he would have stayed in his own land and been all right. But he had a call. The word of God had called him to his homeland. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. God bless a man. You got to change too. Yes, sir. Jesus, true to the Father's word. I do only that which the Father says. It's written, a man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Jesus, forever true to that word. It come a time when he lost all the friends he had. Every one of them forsaken him and went away. All of them. And the people saw him mocked, scoffed, lost confidence in him. How could a man that could speak to a dead man in the grave and raise him up? How could a man that could foretell events to the mark and never never fail? And sat in a course with his face bleeding from pots of beard and the gummy drunken spit from the soldiers running down his face with a rag on his head and hitting him on the head with a stick and said, prophesy and tell us who hit you. Well, the disciples just walked away and said, oh, see, they so quickly forget what God did. Yes. How Moses said at the Red Sea. When he stood there and said, God has done ten outstanding miracles. Are you still so delinquent that you don't know that he's still God? 
He went down there and he smoked the lands. He, he put a curse on the lands. He brought frogs, fleas, flies, everything in a, a blast that killed all the firstborn. And the death angel passed through the land. And yet those people didn't want to follow him to the Red Sea. How quickly, as soon as your popularity, when they've seen this great shining spears of a hundred thousand man coming like that, or maybe, yeah, maybe a million man coming in the roar of the chariots and the dust of flying, they just give up and fell back. Moses, we ought to die back there. God said he let them die in the wilderness yeah. for unbelief. Moses, your ministry's washed up, that's all. You ain't no more. See, they don't understand. They don't get it. And now the same thing was when Jesus, the young rabbi or teacher or prophet of Galilee, when he was doing all those miracles and things, how could he ever stand and put up such a thing as that? How could he let a man bind him with chains when he could break the seal off of a grave and raise a dead man out of eternity? How could he do it when he could speak to a widow's dead son and rise him to life again and Lazarus dead and rotten in the grave and bring him out? How could he stand and say, I'm the resurrection and life? He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And stand and be bound with fetters and spit in the face and not open his mouth. The disciples, he's lost his ministry. Yeah, that's the way it goes. God, this poor world. Even his church. The twelve that he had delighted in and told them everything. And he loved them. They turned their back upon him. Only one stood by him as a man, John. Right in an hour when everything was gone and all hopes was gone. There he was bound and tucked up there and mocked and spit and put his back to the, Not knowing that that fulfilled the scriptures. Why well, don't you know that the things we're going on today is fulfilling the scriptures exactly to the letter? Why does people that may say these things? Why does these denominations rage? Why do they do that? It's written in the scriptures they'll do it. They walk right into it, do it themselves blindly, not knowing they're doing it. You think Judas knew he was playing a part of Judas? You think Pharaoh knew he was playing a part when God raised him up for that purpose? You think Esau would have done the things he did? Certainly not. Said they got eyes and can't see, ears and can't hear. But watch the scripture just unfolding, see? We're at the end time. It's got to be this way. Now, is church forsaken you? All man and nature forsaken you. Talk about somebody being forsaken. Paul had no forsaken at all of what he had. Oh, Even the very creation that he created was forsaken. Yeah. The moon and stars and sun and everything. Yeah. Blat it off. Uh, Man, God, nature and everything forsook him. Nothing's standing there. He died alone. Amen. Did he lose his ministry? <laughs> he is fulfilling his ministry. Yeah. Not losing it. That goes with it. Amen. That's the thing that takes place. That has to go with it. Amen. Now, everything forsaken him. But it was at this time that God stepped in on the scene. Because any man that knows the Word will stay with the Word knowing that the Word is God. Okay? And the Word has to unfold itself. The unfold. Failing word must unfold itself. It's got to in order because the word is God. Yeah. And if it worked on others all down through the age, it'll work the same way right now. Yeah. Because it's God. Don't never forget that. For Jesus know that he being the fullness of the word, yeah, he was not only a prophet, he was God himself. He was the Word. That's why He's not only man for sucking, but also nature for sucking. The whole creation for sucking. Everything, the stars, the moon, and no light when He died. Everything forsaken Him. See, because He is creator of all things. He is in the world, the world is made by Him, and the world knew Him not. See? He was creator of all things. All things, the only thing that we, we don't create, but we try to convert. 
And those who we try to convert is the ones who forsakes and walks away. Oh, yeah. When the time comes for the Word to make its real show, it has to be that way. Now, just remember, it's then that God steps in on the scene. And in the life of our Lord Jesus, the mighty works that He done for the first year and six months of His life, oh, how He was a mighty man. There never was nothing like Him on earth, never was, since, never will be after. But what happened? He got more mockery and any all the rest of them put together. Yeah. Mocked by nature, mocked by creation, mocked by everything because it was in a perverted condition. That's the reason man's hearts mock the true servant of God because it's perverted. Yeah, but. Nature is perverted. Yeah. That's the reason if nature's as pretty as what it is being perverted, what will it be when it gets converted back to the will of God? If a land can bear grapes that takes two men to pack them on their back, what will it be in that perverted land? What will it be when it's converted Amen. back to God? Amen. Christ comes, the desert shall blossom as a rose. There will be a conversion. Well, the dry places will spill up in the water. The earth shall bloom and blossom. Amen. <laughs> oh, that will be a time in when bands of hearts will be converted into a godly man that's been to making their choice. Now will live in that place. Amen. That dark hour, mid-rending rocks and darkening skies, said the poet, my Savior bowed his head and died. The opening veil revealed the way to heaven's joys and endless days. Amen. He had to do that in order to make a way for us. Amen. Right. But what did God do? He was true to the Word and He embraced the cross. But was it the end of His ministry? Was His ministry washed up? God crowned it with the greatest crown that ever did. Oh, yeah. He crowned it on Easter morning on the resurrection. He crowned the ministry of our Lord Jesus. Uh, he raised from the dead and is alive forevermore. Yeah. He was washed up because all men forsook him. Yeah. He was crowned. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He was crowned because that he was had been forsaken. And he must do that. When he raised him from the dead, the same as with Elijah. We spoke of him a few moments ago. Elijah, that poor old broke down prophet laying out there in the wilderness and had to be fed by what the birds would bring him. And his little skinny, drawn up, brown looking body, little crucial oil hanging on his side, his whiskers all out and head probably bald and sunburned. Creeping along down a stick like this, but down beneath that little old heart beat the Spirit of God. When God seen his little old tired servant getting down to the end, everybody forsaking him and everything else, did he lay him down? He set a chariot down, picked up his tired servant. You don't even have to walk up like Enoch did, he'll just take you home in a chariot. He crowned his ministry with a chariot ride home. That's not so bad, you know. Yes, he didn't have to walk home. He just sent a chair and picked him up because he's tired. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Poor little old tired servant. He picked him up and took him home. Is that the time that Daniel stood so loyal to God that he went in? They said, that man, you know, he is once the great fellow here in his kingdom. He's told all kinds of things. He brought the soothsayers in. He taught them things, and the Medo-Persians and how he done. But under the reign of Darius, it was Daniel that stayed true to God. It was Daniel that stayed with the Word of God. Amen. Wouldn't mingle with anything else. And he said, well, his ministry's washed up because I've seen the local paper. He's going to be thrown to the lines then in a few days. <laughs> going to federal prison or something, you see. But we're going to throw him into the lines then. Well, what did God do? God sealed his ministry with a change of the king's heart that draws sent to every language people across the world that every man should fear at the God of Daniel because he was a God that could deliver. Amen. Amen. So you see, it's at that time when man forsake man, God's servants to stay true to the word that God seals their ministry for the crowning time. Yes, is the Hebrew children under the ring of Bel uh, Nebuchadnezzar. When they wouldn't bow to the image, they stayed true to God because God's Word said don't bow before any image to worship it. They stayed true to the Word. And it is in the local paper and the news all about it, whatever it was in them days, they had way scattered news. Not a local newspaper, of course not. Just saying that so you'd have some idea. 
But it was in there that was going to burn him in a fire furnace seven times hotter. For days before that, they'd thrown in all the material to get the furnace so hot that it was seven times hotter, overheated seven times. Uh, Why well, would have consumed him to get the hundred yards of it? But they went right in the fire furnace and come out without even any smell of fire. Amen. And Nebuchadnezzar said, Every man that fails to worship this God, let his children, him be killed, his house burned, and made a dunghill. Yes. Right. Amen. See, they had a worldwide revival because they were true to the Word. That's what happens. Yes, sir. Stay true to the Word. Yes, and it always pays out wonderful. Jacob, we mentioned him a while ago. I got his name wrote down here. Here he was, a little coward, but he was staying his freight of Esau over there. My, my, he knew his way from God. Been away from God all these years, but he always tried to stay true to that word. And here God called him and told him to go to his home. Here he was right in line of duty. And there was Esau with an army. It was at that time hey, that he was changed from the name of Jacob, supplanter, shyster, yeah. to Jacob, a prince before God. When he walked out the next morning with his ministry crowned, walks right out and meets Esau and wanted no help from him. <laughs> Amen. Amen. True to the word. That's the way God does things, isn't it? He, he does things in his own way. All right. Many of my brethren, they're having great popularity today amongst their denominational brethren. You just speak one name, boy, and it's just like fire anywhere. That's right. Say this certain name of this person. After all, when the Lord spoke to me down on the river that day, it spearheaded that revival around the world. Yeah, From yeah. there come every one of those great evangelists. Yeah. Yeah, they went right back with their brethren. See, those denominations in which they come out of, they come out here and hold this meeting, mix up with the denominations, they go right back into them again. Yeah. Yes, that's they right. got a lot of favor, big names on radio, papers, and everything. Everybody speaks well of them. But all men has forsaken me because I've took a true word, true for the word. I stayed right here to what he said to me. Preach the word. Not a denominational philosophy. Preach the word. That was my commission. Stay with the word. Brethren who's listening to this on tape, I was a great guy when I come among you just healing the sick. Speaking of visions and showing things, but when I went to tell you the truth about the Word, what'd you turn your back on me for? Do you realize it's just fulfilling what the Scripture said? Yes. It does that way. Now I can hardly get in a place. Letter comes all the time. One come to the day and said, Brother Bam, I had the greatest of confidence in you, but I heard you say that a certain denomination which I belong to was backsliding. said, I have no more confidence in you at all now. Now on. Said this about twenty five of the brethren of my denomination sat in one of your meetings. Said we just got well, got right up and went off when you said that. Well, all man has forsaken me, but there's one thing, he stood by me. Amen. Amen. Not, I wasn't disobedient to the heavenly vision that happened down on the river. I stayed true to him. It has been true to me. I'm trusting in him someday. I don't know when, for a crowning of my ministry. Amen. I'll say this as true as I could be. I don't know what it'll be. I don't know when it'll be. And I, this one, he's ready. I am. I don't care. I hope he'll crown my ministry as this. Uh, letting me take the clothes of the Word and dress his bride. The clothes of the Word and for his righteousness. I hope he'll crown me and let me stand on that day. Say, Behold, the Lamb of God yeah. that takes away the sin of the world. There's so many hills to climb upward. Strange sometimes, it gets hard. But the one that points the pathway knows just what's best. He knows what's best. The toils of the road will see nothing when we get to the end of the way. Yes. Let's hunt for that bloody footprint. Amen. Just remember, friends, the sands has been washed in the footprints of that stranger on Galilee shore. Amen. And that voice that subdued the rough billows will be heard in Judea no more. Amen. But the path of that lone Galilean 
so gladly I follow today. When the tar of the road will see nothing when I get to the end of the way. Now, this first part of the scripture I read, he gave to me. I was a young man, just a boy, standing out there, shoulders straight, chest throwed out, shock of wavy black hair. Now I stand stoop-shouldered, bald-headed, graying, an old man of 53 years old. But he's sweeter as the days go by. I'm not shunned to declare to you the whole gospel of Jesus Christ. And my heart's desire is to meet the church, which he has died for, clothed in the righteousness of his own blood, dressed in his word and the righteousness of his word, for his word can never fail. And therefore I know if I'll stand by the word and be true to the word, and if the word abides in me and I in him, at that day I'll be happy that I stay true. Amen. I don't know what the future holds, but you see where we're at, don't you? Amen. You see why everybody's saying, even to my, some of my own colleagues, said, why, well, Brother Bram's all washed up. <laughs> see? Yeah. All washed up, see? Oh, we don't hear much more done. <laughs> See, why we, they just don't understand. That's Amen. Just don't Amen. understand. I think the greatest thing that Paul wanted when he said, my time is up now, the greatest desire of Paul's heart was to be a martyr. That was the desire of all their hearts in them days. If, they, if you ever read the Fox Book of the Martyrs, also read also the Nicene Council, the greatest honor they could be when... Different ones from Polycarp and them walked into the lines, then they shouted with joy. Walking there knowing that there's going to be a martyr. When he was burnt to the stake, they screamed with joy for the honor of being a martyr. When Paul walked down to that chopping block to have his head cut off, bled from that prison house, a little old dungeon place down there in a hole in the wall where they had him. I walked down there and looked at it. A little old crick back there where he slammed his body into it. Now I want to make him a saint of something in the same group of people. There he walked down there. <laughs> He said, oh, death, where is your sting? <laughs> Grave, where is your victory? But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. I fought a good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. There's a crown laid up for me, and not only for me, but all those who love his appearing. We've come down to the sixth verse now, to the 18th. I don't know what it'll read for me, but I'm only quoting you what it's read for others. And I'm going to continue to stay true to the word. Until he's finished. That's where the ministry is today. I'm not washed up. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I hope I'm just washed in. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Let us bow our heads now while we pray. There's a little rope reaching down from the throne tonight. It's called the lifeline. While I'm praying, I hope it drags by ever unconverted person in here. Won't you reach up and take a hold of it, sinner friend? You say, Brother Bram, you said you was getting old, and I guess that's the reason you... No, brother, sister, when I was just a little boy, I believe this, I'd give my life for it. And there's only one regret I have. I haven't got but one life to give. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If I had 10,000 lives, I'd want to give them all for Hallelujah. it. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Won't you take hold of the line when it passes by tonight your way? You say, Brother Bram, I'm not worthy to take hold of it. I know you're not, child. But you go do something to get worthy and tell me what you've done. I want to do it too. The only thing you can do to get worthy. You was born unworthy. Yeah. The only one thing you can do is take a hold of the way that's made for you. You're drowning. Don't drown in that. God stowed out the lifeline. Let's, let's reach and get it tonight. Heavenly Father... I remember right here at this same desk, this same place, where I spoke of that morning, that when I dedicated the church, right up on this ground here, and that cornerstone lays there, still holding a leaf out of the Bible that I wrote that. I said, Lord Jesus, with your grace, I'll stay true to the Word. And now I see it produced just exactly what it done in other times. And here I am in this tabernacle tonight after traveling the world. Back again. And the little cornerstone still lays there and the paper's in it. Search me, Lord. I'm 
I made many mistakes. I, I've done wrong, Lord. Many times I failed you. As I just testified a while ago about a failure. God, I, I quickly as I do it, I, I, I want forgiveness. My heart, I love you. And I, I know you showed me recently about that place we're going. And I don't know when you're through with me now, Lord. I, I'm here tonight I, I, by your grace, and I, I don't know when you're through, but I know this has to come to this. But when it comes that time, I, I don't want to be a coward. I want to stand like the rest of them stood. But God, if, if, if I have to seal my testimony with my own life or whatever it is to be done, Lord, crown it them. Hallelujah. Not crown me, crown the ministry that I've preached, Lord, it's your word. Yes. And I know that word is more than able to raise me up again at the resurrection. Hallelujah. And I'm not ashamed of the word that I have preached because it's the power of God and the salvation to as many as believe. Yes. I thank you for the little church still standing today. When I took that stand for the word, Hallelujah. the prophets prophesied and said in six months it will be turned into a garage. Thirty years has passed. <laughs> She's more on fire today than it's been in years. On <laughs> this rock, I'll build my church. We thank you for our pastor. We thank you for the deacons, the trustees. We all got a little part to play, Lord. And we want to play it loyal. We want to play it right. There may be some in here like to join up with us tonight, Lord. And the way they join it is just take hold of this little lifeline and go to pull it. Wrap it around their wrist. Tied around their heart and say, Now, Lord, pull. Lift me up. They'll come forth and shine as gold. Grant it, Lord. We're looking for that time. We believe that it's near the end. We see that as we have been teaching here, the Lady of Sin Church Age is now on. We see there can't be nothing else happen but the coming of the Lord. Lord, wouldn't that be a great crown for the Word? To see the crown Himself come? I like to be standing here and say, there he is. Amen. That's the Lamb, like John did. Behold the Lamb that we have waited on. This is he, the Lord, will quickly come to his temple, take away his people in a rapture. Make us ready, Father. Wash our hearts in your blood. Make us pure and clean that your word might abide in us. May we remember that we must act upon the Word in order for it to take a hope and to be effective. Grant every sinner repentance. Bless everyone who's in here, the saints. Those, some of these old precious warriors, Lord, has been battling along the line for years. Made fun of, talked about, ridiculed. They're still going on because they got life. They know who they believe and persuaded is able to keep that which they've committed to them. We thank you for that. Pray that you'll heal the sick that's in our midst. Take all of our sins and sicknesses away. Father God, get glory to yourself. I've got so many precious friends, Lord. I, I love them. I know other man has down through the age too. Precious friends, loving friends, young and old. We love them with all of our heart. Now make us true, Lord, just true to the word that we might meet him in a better land someday. Or... There will never be no sadness or sorrows. We're looking for the coming of the Lord soon. We believe it; he shall come. Now bless the unbeliever here tonight, Lord, and may he become a believer and accept you as his Savior tonight. And while we have our heads bowed, if there would be someone here with your head bowed, would say, Brother Branham, way down deep in my heart, I want to come to the end of the road fighting a good fight. I want to be a Christian. I'm going to raise up my hand. God bless you. God bless you. That's good. God bless you. I want to come to the end of my road with a good fight behind me. I'm accepting Christ just now. I want him to be my helper. All right. The Lord bless you. God bless you, lady. That is good. He, he knows you. I've learned enough about him in all these years, about 32 years now behind the pulpit. I've learned enough about him now to know that he knows every move that you make. He sees a sparrow. The hairs of your head are numbered. See, he knows all about it. You just raise your hand and meet it. That's all you have to do. And there's water ready. Remember, what do you do? You repent. Believe on the gospel. And then be baptized. What for? For, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. Yes. That's your testimony. 
that you are, your sins are gone. When you are baptized, you confess them, you believe. Won't you catch the lifeline now as it pulls across your heart and say, Come this way, pilgrim. Journey with me. Take my cross upon you and learn me. I'm meek and lowly heart. My burdens are light. <coughs> it's reaching to take a hold of. How many Christians are in the way tonight in here that are happy that you started a long time ago, down the major start, and way down along the road, still coming down towards the end? I pray that God will crown your ministry, whatever it is, maybe a housewife. I pray that God will crown your ministry. It may be a preacher. It may be a deacon. It may be a lay member. It may be a farmer. I don't know what it is. Whatever it is, may God crown your life with the glory of His Word. And His second coming, rapture you and take you away into another land. Or you'd just be like that little fish I talked about. Oh, that blackness down there. See, you couldn't go up there at this kind of a body. Neither could you go up like these astronauts. See, you have to be in a pressurized tank. You're not pressurized for it. But when God changes you, you're pressurized then. You're going in the rapture then. Well, these old earthly senses have been lost and you're gone on in that glorious way of the cross. Going home with Jesus. Now, Father God, we thank you for these hands that come up for to be Christians. I believe that they meant it in their hearts. I pray for them. That they will not any time fail. And if they do fail, may quickly they have that advocate with the Father. Which I have learned to be such a great thing, Father. Amen. That when I make all my mistakes, then I find that I have an advocate right quick with the Father through Jesus Christ. And I'm brought back into grace again. The loving hand of the Lord wipes away. There's a bloody sacrifice laying there that I confess to be my Savior. All that's sick and needy, I pray that you'll supply their needs and heal all the disease, Lord. And those that are here now sitting under this glorious anointing of the Holy Spirit as we feel it so sweetly pouring over our soul. Uh, Father God, you know what I was thinking about coming down from Canada the day I thought, oh, how I'd love to get in an old-fashioned revival again. Yeah. And just the saints of God are singing and the power of God are falling. Yeah. Oh, how my heart longs for it, Lord. May there break such a revival in this tabernacle. Oh, that the power of God uh, will just pour yeah. down and streams of grace go into every heart. I thank you for this little place, Lord. We wasn't able to keep it this way. It's been your grace that's kept it spiritual. But now I believe, Lord, the most spiritual little spot in the nation that I know of is right here at 8th and Penn Street. How I thank you for this, Lord. Going into the churches and seeing cold and indifferent and the women so bold that they can't even blush and not an amen or a tear on a cheek or nothing and no salvation, no Nothing but just join their church and say their creed. Oh, God, then come into a sweet little warm place where the fires are built on every altar of their heart. What a comfort it is, Father. What a comfort. Thank you, Father. May it ever remain until the coming of the Lord Jesus. Bless us together now. And tomorrow's the Sabbath. And Lord, help me in the morning if it falls my lot to preach on that countdown. God, may I be able to bring it in such a way to the people to see it, Lord. And now may they see the state of the ministry and where it's at and what we're waiting for and why everything is going on the way it is. May they read from the fifth verse on and then realize the place that we're standing. And now, Father, I pray that you'll bless us and give us good rest in our bodies and bring us back tomorrow. Bless all these people standing around the walls, leaning from one foot to another. Women, men, and stand out in the rain out there and around the windows and sitting in their cars and all up and out. I pray that you'll bless them, Lord. May they go home with the grace of God in their heart. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Do you understand now? Yes. Amen. Read from 1 2 Timothy 2, 4. 2 Timothy 4, from the 5th verse on down, before you go to bed tonight if you can, and you'll see where we're at. Why did them man forsake him? Why did he come? And now just compare that ministry with what we're going through today. Compare the teaching of St. Paul. Remember in the little heavenly thing that I saw? I said, well, will Paul have to stand with his people? They said, yes. I said, I'll preach the same word he did. Just exactly stayed for the same gospel. And millions throw up their hands and said, we're resting on that. Lord bless you. Do you love him? Yes. Until we
Jesus be till we meet, till we meet. God be with you till we meet.